All right, everyone. So let's get started. Let's jump in, and we're going to start with Dr. King. So again, as Dr. Chalasani said, Dr. King comes from Duke. She's an assistant professor of medicine there. She's also the medical director for the liver transplantation program, and and I've known Lindsay for a number of years, and she has just been a huge advocate for patients. And in fact, I think I've sent you a few patients as well down there as well, and uh, everyone just raves about her. She is incredibly kind, caring, but she's brilliant as well. And uh, she sees patients before and after liver transplantation. And this, with this, she has a clinical interest in autoimmune liver disease, specifically AIH, which is great for us, but also primary biliary cholangitis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. King. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I am really excited to be back here in person. I learned so much from this conference, and looking at this agenda, it is so exciting today. Um, thank you, Craig, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to speak on autoimmune hepatitis 101, and you all know this disease better than anyone and could probably give this talk very well. Uh, but I learned so much when I prepare these talks for patients, and um, my patients really inform what I'm going to say today. So autoimmune hepatitis. It is an immune-mediated inflammatory disease of the liver. It's of uncertain cause. Immune cells attack healthy liver cells and cause damage and eventually scarring without treatment. It likely results from a person's genetics plus some environmental trigger, and we don't know what that trigger is. Some people say viruses, certain medications. It's female predominant, and it occurs across all age groups and ethnic groups. There are age peaks around 10 to 40 and then 40 to 60. It's rare, one in 30,000 in the US. There's frequently no family history of autoimmune hepatitis, but there is a family history of other autoimmune diseases. And patients with autoimmune disease tend to have other autoimmune diseases. So it's recognized when we do diagnose autoimmune hepatitis that we screen for other autoimmune diseases, thyroid disease and celiac disease. So I'm gonna take you back to biology, just bear with me for a second here. But we have, in terms of the immune system, we have the innate, and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is what happens right away. If you get infected with a virus, the innate immune system comes, tries to attack that virus, and then it leads to the development of a more specific immune response called adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity involves the production of B cells, which produce antibodies, and then T cells. And these T cells develop and can actually go in and kill the cell with a virus in it. And there's two types of T cells. There's killer T cells and then helper T cells. And these are the cells that are involved in damage to the liver in autoimmune hepatitis. So this is, this is a liver lobule, and the liver is divided into a number of lobules, and these little kind of brownish areas, the hepatocytes there, and basically blood flows in from the portal vein and then goes out here into the central lobule. And in autoimmune hepatitis, these cells are getting damaged by those immune cells. So how do people present? Well, a number of people, about 25%, can be asymptomatic. A doctor just checked their liver test as part of a wellness exam. Patients can be symptomatic. You all just went through a number of symptoms there, and I'll go through those. Patients can present with a more acute, severe presentation, an acute hepatitis, or about 30% may have scarring or cirrhosis at the time of diagnosis. Age affects the presentation, gender, and ethnic backgrounds. Hispanics tend to present with cirrhosis, and non-white persons tend to have a more aggressive course. Often the first sign is what we call elevated aminotransferases. So you guys have heard the term ALT and AST. ALT comes primarily from liver cells. AST can come from liver cells and other tissue, muscle. It can be anywhere from 100 to the enzymes being very high in a severe hepatitis, about 1,000. As I mentioned, 25 to 30% will have no symptoms. 5% can prevent with, with liver failure and jaundice. And then there are a number of other symptoms, fatigue being the main predominant one, but weakness, joint pains, poor appetite, uh, depression, irregular menstrual cycles in women. So I like to always do a case when I'm presenting. Um, so this is a 59-year-old woman who had liver tests checked at an annual wellness visit. A few months later, they were rechecked. They were pretty high, but AST about 200, ALT about 500. She'd been feeling tired, but really nothing else. She had some hypothyroidism for which she was on medication, no other antibiotics, no herbals, drink about one drink a week. So what are we, how are we going to evaluate her? So how do we make this diagnosis? If I'm thinking maybe she might have autoimmune hepatitis, how do I make that diagnosis? 
So I look at the pattern of the liver enzymes. For autoimmune hepatitis, the AST and ALT tend to be the predominant elevations rather than the alkaline phosphatase. I have to exclude other causes of liver disease, viral hepatitis, hepatitis A, B, and C. Wilson's disease is a disease of too much copper seen in younger people. Drug-induced liver injury. Many medications can cause liver injury that can mimic autoimmune hepatitis. We have to think about alcohol-related liver injury. And then metabolic dysfunction, associated steatotic liver disease, which is the newest terminology for non-alcohol fatty liver disease or fatty liver. And then we look at autoantibodies. So what are autoantibodies? You've heard of the anti-nuclear antibody. It's an autoantibody. It's present in about 80% of people with autoimmune hepatitis. There's also anti-smooth muscle antibody present in about 60% of people with autoimmune hepatitis. Those are the ones I really check. There are some more other rare ones, anti-liver kidney microsomal and anti-soluble liver antigen. I tend to more check those when I'm thinking about the diagnosis and my regular tests are not leading me there and in younger patients. Immunoglobulin G, or IgG, is a broad class of antibody that you will see checked. It's a marker of autoimmunity, um, and we do check this in autoimmune hepatitis. So this is a study looking at various liver diseases and the presence of autoantibodies. And as you can see, in autoimmune hepatitis, about 80% of people have the ANA, 60% have smooth muscle. But look, there's about 20% of people who don't have autoantibodies. And look here, at, this is a fatty liver, 36% have an ANA. And so hep C, people have ANA and smooth muscle. What it means is that autoantibodies don't necessarily make the diagnosis. They can aid in the diagnosis, but they can be present in normal people. They can be present with healthy livers. They can be present in other liver diseases. Or people with autoimmune disease may not have these. So this is called the simplified diagnostic criteria. You don't need to know this. Your doctor can look at this. But I just want to point out that it's it basically there's about eight criteria here, and you look at the autoantibodies, the level of the autoantibodies, we look at the IgG, we look at findings on a liver biopsy, and we get points. And in this score, a six is a probable diagnosis, and greater than or equal to seven is a definite diagnosis. It's pretty good. If, if you make seven, you probably have autoimmune hepatitis. That means it's 100% specific. But it's only 70% sensitive, and what that means is it will miss people who have autoimmune hepatitis if you rely just on this. So this has to go into place with your physician's clinical judgment. So we go back to our case. Let's work through the score. Viral hepatitis testing is negative. She doesn't have too much copper. She has a low titer anti-nuclear antibody of 1 to 40. She has a smooth muscle antibody that's negative. Her IgG is normal. She also has a liver ultrasound that's normal. So she gets one point for this ANA here, two points for this negative hepatitis testing. Why did she get a liver ultrasound? Typically, when we're evaluating abnormal liver tests, we will do an ultrasound. We can look for other causes of liver disease. You can see gallstones. You may see fatty liver. It also can assess if there is scar tissue there. It is not good for diagnosing cirrhosis. If you see cirrhosis, that's, you know there is cirrhosis there, but it can miss early cirrhosis. But generally, people will get an autoimmune, uh, will get an ultrasound in the workup of abnormal liver test. What about a liver biopsy? You saw it was part of the criteria, the simplified diagnostic criteria. As ANA and smooth muscle can be elevated in normal people or other types of liver disease, we don't have a perfect blood test. 20% of people have none of the typical findings. And treatment involves immunosuppression, which is a big deal and a big commitment. So we need a liver biopsy before we commit to this treatment. It can assess the severity of liver injury. It can tell us about scarring's present. You're going to see it. You have a whole talk on pathology later, so I will stay away from the pathology, but just to say there's F0 or no fibrosis or F4, which is cirrhosis. It can look for other liver diseases. Um, I talked about mazeld or metabolic-associated steatotic liver disease. About 15 to 30% of people may have that as well, and there can be overlap with other autoimmune diseases. Primary biliary cholangitis is one. What's involved in a liver biopsy? You can either do it percutaneously and go through the skin. You can also go through the neck or transjugularly. That means they go into the jugular vein and the hepatic vein, and then they stick into the liver. Generally, the transjugular biopsy is done in patients who may have bleeding risk or be on blood thinners or more advanced disease where they may have fluid in the abdomen and we can't get directly to the liver as well. So just to bear with me for a second for pathology, but if you get a liver biopsy, here's your, uh, lobby, uh, your uh, portal track here, and basically these blue cells are inflammatory cells. And so you see inflammation here going out into these hepatocytes and damaging the hepatocytes, and that's called interface hepatitis and is a 
buzzword for autoimmune hepatitis. It doesn't necessarily mean you have it, but it's part of the, the criteria. So in terms of the diagnosis here, this patient got two points for their biopsy, two points for no viral hepatitis, and one point for their serology, so five. Does that mean this patient doesn't have autoimmune hepatitis? No, and the important thing here is we have to take our clinical judgment. This patient did have autoimmune hepatitis, had most of the criteria, fit the criteria, female, other autoimmune diseases. So clinical judgment can't, you know, has to supersede these scoring algorithms. They're helpful, they guide us, they can be helpful for research studies too. Um, but if you have a patient who has elevated AST and ALT, no viral hepatitis, no other causes of liver disease, no medications, no alcohol causing it, you have a consistent biopsies and the antibodies support it, then you can make that diagnosis. Also, a response to steroids can help tell us that we had the right diagnosis. So, and the ASLD, our association with guidelines, basically says the same thing. Scoring systems should be used to support the clinical diagnosis or to help with research studies. So how do we treat it? So here's a liver with a lot of blue and inflammation. We're gonna make it look like this, nice and pink. So the ASLD recommends that we treat anyone with active disease, basically meaning they have abnormal aminotransferases um, or uh, activity on a biopsy. And we usually use a combination of steroids, uh, prednisone or budesonide, plus azathioprine. Who treats it? Who do you see? A lot of times, I told you, this patient started with their primary care doctor who did some of the original workup. Usually you see a gastroenterologist or hepatologist. A gastroenterologist is trained in all gastrointestinal disorders and liver disease. A hepatologist, like myself, usually does some extra training in hepatology um, for uh, either a year or as part of their fellowship um, and specializes more in liver disease. They also specialize in transplantation, which I do, but I also take care of general hepatology patients with autoimmune disease who do not need liver transplantation. When should you see a hepatologist? Who you see may depend on where you live. Hepatologists tend to be based at academic medical centers. You may be very far from an academic medical center. You should consider seeing a hepatologist if the diagnosis is not straightforward, you're having difficulty tolerating treatment, you're not responding to treatment, you have cirrhosis or more severe liver damage. And you can have both. Many of my patients have a gastroenterologist who's closer to them, but I may see them once a year to check in. Most important is that you have a trusting relationship with your provider, you feel listened to, you can ask your provider questions, because this is a long-term relationship. So steroids, they induce remission, meaning they get rid of that initial inflammation. And we've tried to look at not using steroids, but they're really needed. They really work well to calm down that initial inflammation. They do have side effects, you all know this, elevated blood sugar, blood pressure, mood lability, weight gain, upset stomach, and bone disease. Which steroid? Prednisone is the usual one, usually at a dose of about 40 milligrams per day. Budesonide, nine milligrams per day. Um, it was studied in a randomized trial, and in that initial trial, shown to possibly be better than um, the combination of prednisone and azathioprine, so it was budesonide and azathioprine in that trial. The idea with budesonide is it undergoes first-pass metabolism in the liver, and therefore it's broken down pretty quickly and you don't have as many systemic side effects from it. The issue is if you have a lot of inflammation in your liver or you have cirrhosis, then that doesn't occur and you can still have the systemic effects. Um, so you can't use it in cirrhosis or liver failure. Some more real world data um, came out in 2023 looking at the use of budesonide because um, it didn't pick up use as much as people had expected it to in the real world. It did show that it was not as efficacious as it was thought in the original studies, um, but uh, so that was some more recent data looking at it. The goal, however, is to induce remission with steroids and then try to get patients off steroids and have a maintenance immunosuppression. So what's maintenance? So azathioprine is an immunosuppressive medication. It's the most common medication we use for maintenance therapy, typically dosed 50 to 150 milligrams a day. You will see your doctors check something called a TPMT before, usually. Um, that's an enzyme that metabolizes the medication, and if you're deficient in that enzyme, which is incredibly rare for people to be completely deficient, you can have a low white blood cell count from it. We still have to monitor the blood counts regardless of whether you have that deficiency, but it does help guide us a little bit. Typically, I wait to start this until two weeks after starting prednisone. I want to see the response to prednisone first. And the goal is to continue it for a couple years before you actually consider stopping therapy. 
Side effects, nausea and vomiting can occur early on. You can't have some abnormal liver test from the medication. Those usually go away. There is an idiosyncratic, which means kind of happens out of the blue, cholestatic hepatitis that can occur. That's rare, but it does require stopping the drug. Pancreatitis can occur. It's very rare. There can be a rash, joint pains, bone marrow suppression at a low white count. You will see, if you read the, the label, a risk of malignancy, a lymphoma. Um, that has been borne out more in inflammatory bowel disease, less than autoimmune hepatitis, and it is incredibly rare. So how do I treat it? This slide is courtesy of Dr. Daniel Pratt, who was my mentor at Massachusetts General Hospital when I trained. And I give this to my fellows, and I say, this is a guide, and you will never follow this exactly. Um, therapy has to be response-guided, and it has to be based on the patient tolerance and how they're responding. But it's nice to have something to go by. So I usually start prednisone. Do you have a question? Uh, what, Dr. Pratt? What did you say? Dr. Pratt, Daniel Pratt. Yeah, he said the autoimmune and cholestatic center there. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, feel free to ask questions. Um, so in terms of the treatment, you, I usually start about 40 milligrams of prednisone, and then I check labs every two weeks, and I'm trying to taper the prednisone. I add in the azathioprine about two weeks in. I started a low dose and then bump up two weeks later to the full dose. It takes about six weeks for azathioprine to actually take full effect. And I'm trying to taper off the prednisone, and my goal is as I get down to 15 or 10 milligrams that the liver tests are normal. And the goal is to get off prednisone. But again, no patient follows this recipe and you know, algorithm exactly. Um, other treatments that can be used, you may have heard of mycophenolate mofetil. Um, it is a teratogen and can cause birth defects, so I do not regularly use this in women of childbearing age, but it is a good drug for treatment um, of intolerances um, and people who may not be responding to first-line therapies, tacrolimus and cyclosporin and serolimus, and you'll get a talk on these later. The treatment pearls I have is it's not one size fits all. It has to be tailored to the patient. You have to take into account how severe the disease was at presentation, other medical conditions, how they're responding, and how patients are tolerating these treatments. What happens next? We get the liver test normal. We've monitored them really closely for a while. Do you ever stop getting these every two-week labs? Yes. We tend to go to every three to six months. We monitor blood counts. We do look at an IgG level periodically to show if there's autoimmune activity going on. We talked about a fiber scan. That can help us assess for scar tissue. We don't want to do that right away. When there's inflammation in the liver, the fibro scan score can be quite elevated and falsely elevated. So we want to wait until we have control of the disease. If there is cirrhosis, we'll do an ultrasound every six months to ensure no liver cancer develops. So back to our case. We got the liver numbers normal. The patient's on azathioprine alone. She's feeling well. She asked me if she can stop therapy. What do I tell her? So this was a study of about 130 patients looking at what happened if you took off therapy and who would maintain remission out to five years? Goes down a lot. A lot of people relapse if you stop therapy. So what I tell my patients is this is a chronic disease. I can get it into remission, but there's gonna be a chance of relapse. So we do have a long-term relationship in managing this. The relapse rate at one year, and this was in all comers, was about 60%. If, if you do it and you look at factors that may predict relapse, that risk is lower. Can we think about things that might help guide us? Well, the longer you're on therapy, the less risk of relapse. So people who are on therapy for more than four years had a less risk of relapse compared to others. Other predictors, there is something called drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis. That means a medicine such as an antibiotic might cause autoimmune hepatitis. And usually if you take away that offending agent or give steroids with that, you don't need as long a term therapy. So what, is, what do our societies tell us? They usually say you need two years of normal liver test um, and a normal IgG. They tell us to consider a liver biopsy before doing that, before stopping therapy. Why is that? Sometimes the liver enzymes will be normal, but there's actually inflammation at the level on the biopsy, and sometimes that can help guide us. I have a discussion with my patient about doing a biopsy when we're thinking about coming off of therapy. I'd say there's about a 30 to 50% chance of stopping drugs. If I wean it, I still monitor them. I still check. Once I've kind of watched them really closely when therapy comes off, I still check them every six months for indefinitely. There's a high relapse rate and there's no time limit on it. So, And I also tell my patients, I'll give you a chance off therapy. Depends on how much scar tissue they have. Patients with cirrhosis, I tend to leave on therapy because there's already a lot of scar tissue there. But I avoid multiple relapses. So I usually say one time and no more because multiple relapses read to a 37% chance of cirrhosis. 
Uh, you saw I'm the medical director of liver transplant, but most of my patients with autoimmune hepatitis never need a liver transplant. Um, in a non, at a non-transplant center, the 10-year survival was 91%. Transplant is indicated when people have that severe acute liver failure presentation, or they have what we call decompensated cirrhosis or liver cancer. It's only about 4% of transplants in the U.S., has a good survival rate of 80 to 90%. It can recur, but it usually doesn't affect the long-term survival of the patient. You're gonna hear about this from um, Nadia Blessing lady, later about kind of preventative medicine, but I just wanted to glance at it. You should have a primary care physician. You know, I told you steroids can increase blood pressure, promote diabetes, so you need to be screened, your cholesterol checked, um, blood sugar checked, blood pressure monitored. People need to be up to date on age-appropriate cancer screenings. Immunosuppression can, as I said, there's a rare side effect of malignancy, so pap smears, colonoscopies, mammograms. Patients need skin exams because there is an increased risk of skin cancer with immunosuppression. Um, people need mental health treatment. Depression and anxiety are associated with autoimmune hepatitis. Um, I just told you steroids cause irritability, so we need to have appropriate counseling and mental health treatment. We have to check for bone health, doing bone density scans in patients on steroids or postmenopausal women. We will talk about nutrition, and you'll learn a lot more about that today, about a healthy, balanced diet, the importance of exercise. We'll talk more about alcohol shortly. Um, we think about vaccines, um, the standard vaccines, but all hepatitis A and B, we don't want another liver disease. We want to avoid live vaccines. The MMR or measles, mumps, rubella is live, and we don't want to give that to patients on immunosuppression. Other recs, people always ask me, can I take Tylenol? Tylenol is safe. You can't overdose on Tylenol, but if you limit it to 2,000 milligrams in 24 hours, it is okay. There's no herbal that has been shown to really treat autoimmune hepatitis, and herbals aren't well regulated, so we generally say to avoid them. We talk about pregnancy, pre-planning is important, and then we talk about the importance of caregivers and support groups like the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association. It takes a team to manage this. We have to have partnerships between your physician and the patient and between all the different physicians that could be treating patients with this disorder from primary care physicians to gastroenterologists, hepatologists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists, mental health providers. And we have to have a partnership between patients and their caregivers. So to conclude this talk, the diagnosis can be challenging. I've showed you scoring systems aren't perfect. We have to take the scoring system with our clinical judgment. With aggressive therapy, we can put patients in remission. We can't cure it, but we can put patients in remission without long-term health consequences. There's an understandable desire to get off meds and get off immunosuppression, but we have to treat aggressively enough, long enough before we consider that. It is a chronic condition. We should avoid multiple relapses, and it requires a team to treat autoimmune hepatitis. Thank you. So, so to follow kind of the, uh, the guidelines, what we'll do here is the presenters are ending a few minutes early so we can have some time for questions and answers. Uh, I'm sure Dr. King was also approachable outside of her talk as well, at least this morning before she has to fly back uh, to Duke. Uh, we take some questions from the audience. We're going to see if we can get the microphone working so we can record. But if you can say your question, if you have to repeat it. Go ahead. It's a good question. So we talk about remission being normal ALT and AST. And if you, if you look at your labs, you'll see like a wide range. If you get labs from somewhere, it may say that 20 to 60 is normal. Really, in males less than 35, ALT is normal, and females less than 25. Um, so we do tend to aim for that. Um, what if we're considering stopping meds and, and they're in the, the 30s or something like that, or, or borderline 40s? Um, Sometimes we'll say, gosh, they've been on immunosuppression. It's, it really seems to have worked. Maybe there's another liver disease there. Maybe we should do that two-year biopsy. What, there is a high prevalence of um, metabolic-associated uh, steatotic liver disease. We want to check that there's not another cause for it. I usually do want the liver enzymes normal when I'm stopping medicines. If I stop medicines and I'm watching and the liver enzymes go, they were in the 20s and they go to the mid-30s, right away am I going to restart medicines? No, I may give it a little bit of time to see uh, if something else caused that. Do they have a virus? Is there a medication? Or maybe they'll settle out. 
Um, but if they do tend to creep up to like the 40s, I will tend to think about are we having a flare check, something like an IgG for a marker of autoimmunity. Yes. Yeah, is there like a threshold of cirrhosis that you would recommend people get the uh, fiber scan in six months? So, um, so in terms of the use of the fiber scan, and you guys get a whole talk on this today, fiber scan has been most studied in hepatitis C and then metabolic uh, associated steatotic liver disease. It's not been quite as well studied in autoimmune hepatitis. We need some way to understand how much scar tissue is there. And at the time of initial liver biopsy, we may get an assessment of that. But when there's a lot of inflammation going on in the liver, it can be hard to say of what we're seeing there. It's just all acute inflammation and not scar tissue. Um, so usually the fiber scan is done once the patient is controlled and, and, and can be done in all patients, not just patients with cirrhosis. It's really done to assess how much scar tissue is in the liver. Basically the ultrasound shoots, um, the probe shoots a sound wave through the liver and how fast that sound wave travels depends on how much scar tissue is in the liver. The st stiffness of the liver is what we get and that is associated with kind of no scar tissue or, or there is cirrhosis. So all comers can get the fiber scan and if we see that there is a sign of cirrhosis, then that tells us we need to monitor patients for liver cancer um, and things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, middle table. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is more so for clarity. I want to make sure I heard you correctly. Yeah. Did you say two years minimum before considering the... Two years of remission is what they say. So two years of normal liver test and, and normal. It, the IgG is not always elevated, but if it was elevated and then it got and then it needs to be normal. So, thank you. And certainly we base it on tolerance and other things like that. But general guidance is two years. Uh, yes. uh, table. Good morning, everyone. When you're doing the. Uh, liver biopsy. Mm -hmm. Besides inflammation, what else are you looking yeah. for? Yeah, it's a great question. So when a liver biopsy is done, we're looking for these kind of signs of autoimmune hepatitis type inflammation. Um, we look for certain types of cells called plasma cells that interface hepatitis I showed you. We also want to see how severe the liver damage is, and we can try to assess how much scar tissue. How much, you know, I said about 30% of people may have cirrhosis when they present, so we want to see how much scar tissue is there. And then I said that 5 to 10% may have another, uh, like primary biliary cholangitis or another autoimmune type disease that attacks the liver. And then about 15 to 30% of people may have this metabolic associated steatotic liver disease or fatty liver. And so we're also looking for other types of liver disease. Because if I'm treating someone and the liver tests aren't going normal, but I think I have them on appropriate immunosuppression, maybe there was some of this metabolic liver to fatty liver disease there. And that's driving the liver tests, not the inflammation from the autoimmune hepatitis. So the standard to um, diagnose of autoimmune hepatitis is the liver biopsy. That's, that's the standard of the of diagnosis. So it's a combination of the, the pattern of liver enzyme elevations, the AST and the ALT, the autoantibodies, the, the anti-nuclear antibody, the smooth muscle antibody, and the liver biopsy, and then ruling out other causes of liver disease, namely viral hepatitis, like hepatitis B and C. So it takes kind of all of those clinical pieces together. There's not one perfect test. Thank you. I can answer more questions. Thank you.